Uh, so Jim developed a model with Andy Watson called Daisy World, which in part looks at the role of biodiversity on a planet. Anyway, it's a simple, simple planetary system. It's a, a mathematical model in which you have a sun which increases its brightness as time goes by, much like our own sun has done. Then you have a planet which has severely uh, simplified biodiversity. We may have 30 million species on our planet, maybe more. But say 30 million, there's an upper, limb, upper estimate. On Daisy World, um, Jim and Andy Watson placed two species. These were daisies, one kind with dark petals and one with light petals. And there were seeds of both of these daisies scattered around the soil of the planet. There were no clouds. And um, they both followed a similar growth response, a temperature response. So they would grow similarly according to temperature. There'd be an optimum temperature. And then if it got too hot, they would grow less. And if it was too cold, they would grow less. So it was a sort of bell-shaped response to temperature. Both of them are the identical bell-shaped response. And they set this thing running. And when the sun was small and not very bright, black daisies, dark daisies sprouted all over the planet and rapidly spread because they warmed themselves on the planet. And so we got an explosive positive feedback as black daisies took over the, the space. But then the sun got warmer uh, and it wasn't quite so ad advantageous to be a, a dark daisy because now if you were dark you were warming yourself up slightly above the optimum. And so now there was a, a possibility for white daisies to survive. And they helped to cool themselves on the planet a bit more. And as the sun got brighter and brighter, we got more of a mixture of black and white daisies. And this is based purely on Darwinistic evolutionary principles. Yeah, it is. Uh, the equations, well, the daisies compete for space. There's no actual competition function there, but they're just a, they, they, they do, they just compete for space. The ones that can produce more offspring take over more of the, of the planet. So there's Darwinian competition. Um, and then as the planet gets, as the sun gets brighter and brighter and brighter, the black daisies begin to disappear because they warm themselves too much. And eventually we have a planet with only white daisies. So the planet becomes totally white. So during the uh, history of the sun, during the time, the, the evolution of the sun from less bright to bright, the daisy world goes from black and then to dark grey, lighter grey, as we get more mixture of black and white daisies. And eventually, as the sun gets really, really bright, it's completely white, only, with only white daisies. And then when the sun gets even brighter, daisy world can't regulate anymore, and it, the whole thing dies. Now, that's the point. The point is, what happens to the temperature of the planet overall <clears throat> during this whole time trajectory? And the extraordinary thing that uh, they found and this never ceases to surprise me, is that the temperature of the planet always remained slightly below the optimum for growth, despite changing populations of daisies, black and white daisies, and an ever-increasing solar output. In other words, there was a sort of emergent self-regulation which came out of these simple equations. It's absolutely stunning. <clears throat> and it became a a kind of uh, toy model or a toy demonstration for how the real Earth could work. Um, and then one thing I did with Jim over several years was to explore the role of biodiversity in this model. So he did some of that himself, but uh, I helped him by making food webs that were more or less complex, that had more or less interconnections between them. So you, did, you explored what increased biodiversity would mean to the self yeah, regulation? That's right. Yeah, biodiversity in the sense um, of more interrelationships amongst the species, because we had daisies and then we had herbivores that were grazing the daisies. And um, we, we made the connections between the herbivores and the daisies either dense or not dense. Um, so this is actually is more about complexity of the ecosystem rather than the biodiversity. And we found that the if, if you loosen the connections between the herbivores and the daisies, the, uh, the whole regulation of temperature was much less effective and it actually oscillated. Mm -hmm. And as the daisies and herbivores became more tightly coupled with each other, mm -hmm. uh, as, as the richness of interactions increased mm -hmm. between the herbivores and the daisies, the regulation of temperature improved.
Biodiversity is actually important to maintain Earth's temperature. Yeah, that's my, that's that's that's. I would say that's my speculation or our speculation. I'm not sure that we've got evidence for that scientifically. We do have evidence on a much smaller scale um, from some studies on European grasslands and uh, grasslands in North America that more species in these grasslands lead to better ecosystem functioning, mm. such as nutrient cycling, drought resistance, pest resistance. That's very well established. Uh, the project is called the BioDepth Project, and they've got a very good extensive website um, which details the results. So we know that biodiversity, at least in these grasslands, can stabilize ecosystem functioning. And there's evidence from other small-scale experiments. But at the level of the Earth, it's a speculation to say that biodiversity uh, increases the climate regulation abilities of the planet. So, but I think it does. I think it's a, but I can't back that up with data at the moment. To begin with, there was a huge resistance to it. Uh, this was back in the early 1970s, when Jim first published a paper, uh, I think it was called Gaia as Seen Through the Atmosphere. And there was a terrible reaction, a very strong reaction against it. Um, now, why was that? It's interesting to speculate. <clears throat> Partly is because he used the name Gaia, which, as I said before, is not allowed in science. It's taboo to bring up the name of a goddess. You know, it seemed rather animistic. It seemed to propose that the Earth somehow knew, uh, had purposes of her own, that she had a sort of overall consciousness. It seemed rather new agey, and they didn't like that. But there were other good reasons for uh, criticizing the idea. One was that nobody could quite understand uh, how this self-regulation could happen. Because the conventional view was that the Earth is composed of lots of individually selfish organisms, all competing with each other, you know, in Darwinian ways. And how could all that Darwinian competition give rise to global scale regulation? It, no, no one could see how that could happen. And it's a good point. We still can't see how it can happen. Um, not entirely, anyway. It's still not clear how, how it works. Um, the other criticism was that it implied some kind of mysterious consciousness at the level of the planet that was doing the regulating. It's called teleology, the notion that uh, nature has purposes. And as we all know, nature is just meant to be this blind, dead, mechanical thing with no purpose whatsoever. So these were the criticisms that were leveled against the guy hypothesis, one philosophical, one more scientific. So it was a kind of clash of uh, worldviews, actually, huh? Yes, it was like a clash of worldviews, yeah. Um, because science had been progressing along, at least biology had, and geology, along very mechanistic lines for a long time. Not, of course, not physics. That changed with the quantum revolution in physics and with relativity. But in, in biology and geology and the other sciences, um, there was a very mechanistic uh, outlook. Everything was dead. Everything was also fundamentally predictable. Uh, it was all, or the natural processes were linear in the sense that a given disturbance would produce a predictable uh, effect. Mm. So a small disturbance would produce a small effect, a big disturbance would produce a big effect, and in principle it was thought that these effects could be understood and quantified mm. and modelled mathematically. Um, and um, suddenly Gaia theory was showing that, well, perhaps the Earth, in fact, is more like an organism than it is a mechanism. Um, more like a giant physiology. And perhaps it's more non-linear than people felt comfortable with, that small disturbances might be able to propagate through the system and create large effects, as, of course, happens with our own physiology. So it was disturbing to, to scientists, I think, to think of the Earth as a kind of organism, when they were used to thinking of it as a mechanism, 